which helps me to upload the recordings immediately to the to the website when we're done. Anyway, what types of antimicrobials we looked at so far? So we talked about the inhibitors of the cell wall synthesis, right? Vancomycin, lacitracin, and different types of beta lactams like penicillin and uh, carbapenems, estrionams. We looked at the inhibitors of the protein synthesis, which there are like six classes, okay? And we looked at the inhibitors, the disruptors of the membrane, okay? Polymyxins and daptomycin, the lipopeptide. Okay, so next one that uh, we're going to talk about is two drugs that inhibit nucleic acid synthesis. The title of the slide, I appreciate that, it is a little confusing because it says inhibit inhibition of DNA replication. It should be actually more like nucleic acid synthesis because there are two major classes of drugs that affect synthesis of DNA and RNA in the bacterial cell. One is fluoroquinolones. I believe you've all heard that name ciprofloxacin or cipro. That's probably the most uh, frequently prescribed example of fluoroquinolones. Fluoroquinolones bind to the enzyme in the bacterial cell that is called DNA gyrase. You have heard an enzyme before, I mean not under the same name, it's a synonym for DNA topoisomerase. Does anyone remember what topoisomerase does to DNA? It actually, you mix it up with helicase, but it's, it's a good, it's a good mistake. It keeps it from supercoiling. It straightens it up. And if you inhibit this enzyme, okay, does that make sense? If you inhibit this enzyme, there is no DNA replication. Cell cannot divide. Cells die. Okay? Make sense? So it's a broad spectrum antibiotics. Um, the good one. Okay, but the pro and it treats all kinds of infections. The problem, of course, as usual, is resistance, and we'll talk about it. Uh, another drug that I want to mention, I have a special connection to it, uh, rifamycin. Well, rifampin is the name of the drug. It belongs to the class of drugs, rifamycin. It's a naturally sourced antibiotic. This one has fairly limited spectrum of activity, but it's very active against mycobacterium tuberculosis, which makes it quite unique because you probably have noticed <clears throat> for many drugs, I say, oh, this is active gram against gram-positive, this is active against gram-negative, and then I specifically highlight that one or another drug is active against mycobacteria because mycobacteria is such a huge public health problem and it's awfully hard to treat. So uh, rifampin works by inhibiting RNA polymerase. I mentioned before that RNA polymerase has a, you know, kind of shape of an open fist. So DNA polymerase is in that fist. Rifampin binds to the active site, okay? It binds to the active site and prevents synthesis of RNA. So it's competitive inhibitor of RNA polymerase in bacteria. These drugs have uh, pretty high selective toxicity, which means they act um, on bacterial cells but practically do not inhibit DNA or RNA synthesis in the eukaryotic cells. Why do you think these drugs have high selective toxicity? Not 
That is one reason. Very good. That is actually one of the main reasons. Structural, structural differences between the transcription in, and replication in eukaryotes and prokaryotes. I mean, the old drugs have toxicity, okay? But we, you're going to see there are some, like, polymyxins that disrupt membrane are extremely toxic. They have huge side effects. These guys have much smaller side effects. A lot of those side effects are derived more from um, disrupting the, the microbiome rather than direct toxicity to the cells. Does that make sense? <clears throat> now, I, I failed to, I think I failed to mention it on Tuesday. Um, did we talk about the list of essential medications by WHO? So, a lot of, some drugs are on the list of essential medications, and pretty much all antibiotics are. So, what it is, WHO issues and updates regularly, so-called list of essential medications, so the drugs that must be available to the general public um, to treat diseases that can be lethal or, you know, high morbidity and so on and so forth. So to give it, for instance, like ibuprofen or penicillin are on that list. Viagra is not. Okay. Uh, now, interesting thing also is to, to check uh, the prices of the drugs. If you would look at the prices, I specifically looked up the antibiotics. If you would look at the prices of the drugs, antibiotics in developing countries and in the United States, the prices are going to be different. Which price is going to be higher? U.S., about four times, okay, because insurance companies can shell out some money for that, okay. Now, next class of drugs that we're going to talk about is sulfa drugs and trimethoprim. Sulfa drugs and trimethoprim inhibit two different steps of a specific metabolic pathway that leads to the synthesis of the folic acid. The function of the folic acid, the necessity, folic acid is the precursor molecule for synthesis of nucleotides, which means that folic acid is the source, right? Folic acid is modified to become nucleotides. So if there is no folic acid, there are no nucleotides. No nucleotides no DNA. Does that make sense so far? We're getting there. We're getting there. So what I want you to understand now, there is a pathway, metabolic pathway, that leads to the synthesis of folic acid. Okay? So this path pathway starts with para-aminobenzoic acid, which is modified by the enzyme called dehydropterate synthase into dehydrofolic acid. Dehydrofolic acid is then reduced by dehydrofolate reductase into the folic acid. I'm really proud of that speech because it consists mostly of not English words like folic acid and tetrahydrofolic acid. And I hope I scared the living daylights out of you. And no, you don't need to know the names of the enzymes. No. You will not get the question about the enzymes. Okay? You will not get the question about these intermediates. Don't worry. But I really want you to understand how sulfur drugs and trimethoprim work. Sulfur drugs various derivatives of sulfonamide, for instance, sulfamethoxazole, are structural analogs of para-aminobenzoic acid. They aren't the same, <coughs> sorry, they aren't the same, but they're structurally similar. 
You agree with me? That you see the similarity, right? So sulfonamide binds to the active site of dehydroptyrate synthesis, synthetase, okay, that first enzyme, and blocks its function. Since sulfonamide binds to the active site, what kind of inhibition is that? Competitive, yes. So sulfonamides are competitive inhibitors of this enzyme, dehydroptyrate synthase. By itself, sulfonamides are bacteriostatic. Trimetoprim is a molecule that is structurally similar somewhat to dehydrofolic acid. So trimetoprim can inhibit dehydrofolate reductase right here. Okay. That makes sense? Trimetoprim inhibits dehydrofolate reductase, second enzyme. And by itself, trimetoprim is also bacteriostatic. But when you combine those two molecules together, when you combine sulfamethoxazole and trimetoprim, TMP SMX. In combination, <clears throat> they become bactericidal. Does that make sense? So these two drugs inhibit two different steps, and they competitively inhibit two different steps of the same metabolic pathway that essentially converts paraminobenzoic acid into the folic acid. <coughs> Does that make sense? that particular class of drugs. Are there any questions about this? They Yes, they mostly used in combination. And yes, TMPSMS. Um, I think they can be some Bactrim, Bactrim, but yeah. Um, one of the side effects that uh, actually a family, I, I give a lot of examples from my family because they're not here and they don't really care. And I don't really care either. Uh, one of my kids was on Bactrim, I don't remember for what, the oral one. It's often prescribed in, in, a, in the form of topical, the ointment, but he was on the oral one. And he was fine like two, three days. And then one night, he's just rolling on the floor screaming, saying that his, his stomach is killing him. So we went to the ER, and they said, just stop taking antibiotics. I thought he has appendicitis. <coughs> it was so bad. But it can give you really, really, really uh, severe uh, stomach pain, abdominal pain. Um, and so this drug, as I mentioned, they're called uh, antimetabolites. They inhibit different metabolic pathways. So another prominent antimetabolite is isoniazid. Uh, this drug is unique in essence because it inhibits the synthesis of mycolic acid, which microbes absolutely require mycolic acid. Myco, platinum myco, which bacteria require mycolic acid? Myco, bacteria. And most prominent mycobacteria is tuberculosis. So isoniazid is a specific drug to treat tuberculosis. It's an important component of anti-TB treatment. Okay? Does that make sense? It's really a great drug. Now, this guy has some toxicity. You know, I mentioned hepatotoxicity and neurotoxicity. But diarrheal quinolones are the ones that um, almost are on par with polymyxins. Diarrheal quinolones have high rate of side effects. 
but they are another drug of choice to treat mycobacterial infections. These compounds uh, inhibit ATP synthase. If you recall the um, oxidative respiration, the last step is electron transport chain. An electron transport chain generates the hydrogen gradient, right? Hydrogen ion gradients. So you have that uh, ATP synthase and hydrogens flow through the ATP synthase and churn out. ATP synthase churns out ATP. Diarrheal quinolones stop ATP synthesis, starving the cell, right? Well, <clears throat> specificity, of course, is not 100%. So they would do exactly the same to cells of the host, human cells. And they have fairly high toxicity for the liver. And also, they affect the functioning of the cardiac muscle, causing arrhythmias. Okay? And when we will talk about resistance, you will see why... <clears throat> it's important to have this drug. So <laughs> when we're going to talk about resistance? We're going to talk about resistance now. I'm going to ask you, you're going to answer questions now. How resistance, how does it appear? First of all, what drives resistance? Mutations. Hmm? Okay. What? Mutations. Overuse of what? Antibiotics, okay. So, use of antibiotics, just generally use of antibiotics and mutations. Those are different sides of the same multi-sided coin. So, for a second, forget about medicine, okay? Forget about pharmacology and think from biology, pure biology standpoint. So, when we say mutations, which molecule do we refer to? DNA, right? So, mutations in DNA. Okay. When we refer to overuse of antibiotics or use of antibiotics, how can we describe antibiotics put on microbes? What do they put on microbes? There's a strict term to it. Selective pressure. Does that make sense? They put on microbes their selective pressure. <clears throat> now, Let's say you have a microbe that is resistant to whatever. Let's use methicillin resistance to philococcus, okay? It has its penicillin binding protein is different. Now, this resistance to methicillin, can we consider it a trait? Yes, it is a trait, right? So microbe has a different trait, and this different trait is what it's it, it is a phenotype. What defines phenotype? Gene gene expression, yes. So essentially, resistance is defined by the expression of certain genes. Is that clear? Now, so microbe that is resistant have essentially a gene or genes that confer that resistance. These genes, where they can be, in which molecules, genes, okay, DNA, DNA can exist in which forms? Chromosomes and plasmids, okay? Which of those two are transferred between cells easier? Plasmids. So when in the future you're all going to be medical professionals, is that right? We don't have any renegades who want to go to biotechnology, I think. Renegade. Say hello to Joe Dick. Um, no, it's okay. But when you read about well, for you, it's, for your application, it's going to be even more important because that's how you select for the clones. When you read about resistance, uh, 
people in the medical field, people in infectious diseases, they start to get really concerned when they find that resistance is not chromosomal, but plasmid mediated. Because this resistance will spread through the population like a, like a forest fire. Does that make sense? Okay. So, what was I talking about? Resistance, yes. <clears throat> so, things that we have to think about. First, it's a genetic. Okay. Resistance is the gene. And second, that it can spread through population. Now, before we move on, I want to ask you another question. Out there in the soil, you know, like in the dirt, there are plenty of microbes. True? Do they have resistance to, say, strepto... May they have... Uh, may they be resistant to streptomycin? Yes. How? We don't, we don't just dump streptomycin in the dirt. Uh, from where? Good. Exposed to, to streptomycin. From where? Huh? The what? No. If that strep... Huh? Huh? I mean, we use antibiotics, but not that much. No. Where does streptomycin come from? Okay. Streptomycin is natural antibiotic. So it comes from the bacteria called streptomyces. That's what exposes other microbes to streptomycin. Does that make sense? Antibiotics, natural antibiotics that we use, we humans are so anthropomorphic, anthropocentric, it's disgusting. Seriously. You know, when, pe when you read about evolution, humans are the most evolutionary successful animals on the planet. Bullshit. If tomorrow there will be a nuclear war and the humanity will be eliminated, which will happen, you know, someday, okay, when humanity will be gone, bacteria are going to be here anyway. Does that make sense? In terms of the species number, the bacteria are the first. Total biomass, we're not even close. Forget about bacteria, think about arthropods. There are something like a million species of arthropods, if not more. So, come on, we're not, we're not the most successful species on the planet. Unless you judge success but that, but, but by ability to poison the environment. So, the antibiotics were used by bacteria as a chemical warfare against each other. Does that make sense? And some of them developed resistance against that chemical warfare over the years. So some microbes actually, we call it intrinsic resistance. They are intrinsically resistant to antibiotics. It's not our fault that some micro microbes cannot be treated with, I don't know, aminoglycosides or tetracyclines. They just so happen they're resistant, right? Um, now this is gonna be intrinsic resistance. But that resistance is still mediated by the genes, and it can be acquired by other microbes. Does that make sense? Now, how our usage of antibiotics drives the resistance in the population? Uh, if I would uh, take a sample of microbes from anywhere, put it in the TSA plate, and grow it without any antibiotic, what do you think? Are there going to be any antibiotic resistance cells? Yes. You won't be able to tell them apart, but there will be cells that are antibiotic resistant. If I will <clears throat> try to grow microbes on the plate with incredibly high concentration of antibiotic, will it grow? Incredibly high, probably not. Be it, they will all die. 
but if the concentration will be low, then which ones will grow? The resistant ones. So essentially, by using antibiotics prophylactically, sometimes it's inevitable. By not sticking to the protocol for like taken for seven days, three times a day, all the way, uh, we essentially expose microbes to lower concentrations. We don't kill all of them, and therefore we select for resistance. Does that make sense? What is the largest, well, not in India, but in developed countries, what is the largest source of uh, resistance to antibiotics? Who, who, who is to blame here in the States? Huh? Hmm? No. Poultry and cattle farms. Right? Yes. And you know what? And the dosage is really small. So it's low dosage antibiotics drive resistance in those animals like crazy. And then those microbes end up on and in humans inevitably. Does that make sense? Even if they're not pathogenic to humans, those genes can be passed on to, to uh, humans. There was a study in Netherlands where they looked at the pathogenic E. coli in humans, and it was antibiotic resistant E. coli, and then they looked at the uh, strains of E. coli found in poultry. Those were identical. Okay? So same, and then they looked at Klebsiella, which is the human pathogen, and the E. coli strands from um, poultry again. And they found the same genes that conferred the same type of resistance. So s somehow, resistant genes from the poultry microbes ended up in the human pathogens. Now, as far as I know, in Europe, they try to abandon the use of antibiotics for the uh, in the uh, in the far in the farms. I don't think it's going to have a huge impact because most of the meat is produced in China anyway, like everything. Um, and I don't think they're going to care much about usage of antibiotics, at least now. So, and here in the states also, we add antibiotics because they grow better, they grow faster. We don't treat disease, we just try to prevent them altogether. Now, what are the mechanisms of resistance? I, yeah, you, you see them here, but I want you to try and figure it out yourselves. So we're going we're gonna to take a walk through the mechanisms. And for this, uh, you have to think like a microbe. If you're a bacteria, you're a microbe, and you are exposed to a drug. How can you protect yourself? What are the ways? So here's the bacteria, here's the drug. How can I protect myself from that drug? On a very basic level. Hmm? So it doesn't get into me. Yes. So I can prevent drug from entering. Make sense? What else? Hmm? So increase the population. Doesn't work this way, but uh, it's not listed here. You can overwhelm the drug. We'll get to that. If you intoxicate, what do you do? You puke, yes. So cells can pump the drug out. Drug. What else, if the when the drug is inside? How cells cells can deal with it? Can destroy it, right? So some cells can do it. They can destroy and activate drugs. And 
drugs, they usually target something, like aminoglycosides target ribosome. Uh, cephalosporins target penicillin binding protein. So all drugs have a target. What else? What, what is another option? If you have a guy in your house who shoots everybody who wears, I don't know, red jacket, change your clothes. So change the target. Does that make sense? Cells change the target, so target protein still performs its function, but drug doesn't inhibit it anymore because it doesn't recognize it. Does that make sense? Those are basic mechanisms, but this table expands on it a little bit. So first, modification of the drug, and I will, I will explain what I expect you to know regarding this. Okay, so modification of the drug. Penicillins, cephalosporins, carbapenems, all drugs that contain beta-lactam ring, okay? They can be hydrolyzed by the enzyme called beta-lactamase, okay? So that's an example of drug modification. Does that make sense? Well, drug is altered in the cell, so it becomes ineffective. Is that clear? Drug is altered, changed by the cell, so drug becomes ineffective. Is that clear? Awesome. Prevent drug from entering into the cell. Pseudomonas aeruginosa. I don't have one. Well, this this is likely it. Anyway, Pseudomonas aeruginosa is the gram-negative uh, opportunistic pathogen of humans. Gram-negative means what is the structure of the cell wall? Cell envelope, huh? So thin cell wall, what's on the outside? Even more in gram-negatives. They have cell membrane, cell wall, and then outer membrane. Okay, so three layers, outer membrane. Outer membrane contains proteins called porins. Well, guess what they do? They, yeah, they essentially the entry points. They form openings in the membrane, allowing the passage of different drugs and chemicals and whatnot through the membrane. So Pseudomonas aeruginosa decreases the production of one of those porins, essentially shutting off the drug income, the, the influx of the drug into the cell. Does that make sense? Okay, good, okay. Um, efflux pumps. When you see the word pump, what type of transport should you think about immediately? Active. Active means you need what? ATP. Bingo. So efflux pumps. Pump the drug out, but cell uses ATP, right, to pump it. So cell has to spare some energy to pump the drug out. I mean, of course cell is not going to die, but it's still the drug represents a certain fitness disadvantage. Cell has to spend ATP for pumping it out. Does that make sense? Um, modification of target. One of the great examples is the low affinity penicillin binding protein in MRSA. So I want to remind you how uh, Penicillins generally work. So we have penicillin, okay, and we have penicillin binding protein. Right? Follow me? So these two guys bind together, form complex, which in which penicillin binding protein is inactive. Does that make sense? 
Now, the function of penicillin binding protein is to what? Do you remember? M establish linkages between peptidoglycan chains. Cell wall So, well, synthesis is inhibited. <clears throat> Does that make sense? Terrific. If penicillin binding protein has low affinity, what does affinity mean? So, penicillin binding protein has low affinity to penicillin. Doesn't really bind with it, yes. So low aff affinity is the ability to bind, okay? So, if PBP doesn't bind penicillin, it's safe. Does that make sense? So, the drug target, which is PBP, is modified now. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, overproduction of the target. I call it the brute force method. Remember this... Um, this guy's over here. Uh, this guy's, yeah. So, sulfur drugs and trimetoprim <clears throat> inhibit enzymes. If you overproduce the enzymes, drugs will still inhibit some of them. But there will be a lot of free enzymes that will work just fine. Does that make sense? Does it? Okay. Enzymatic bypass. This is what you can see when you put when when there's some sort of a barrier on the pedestrian walk. People walk around it. So if drug inhibits a certain metabolic pathway, okay. Microbe may have adaptations to it so that the same product will be made using a different metabolic pathway. Does that make sense? Pretty much like a detour. Okay. And finally, target mimicry. I came with a really unpleasant analogy of this. Uh, like a dog that is humping somebody's leg. Dog thinks it's another dog, but it's not. Right? So same here. Cell produces something that looks like a target, walks like a target, walks like a target, but not a target. So drug binds to it instead of binding to the target. Does that make sense? For instance, like uh, the peptides that look like DNA, because the binding of fluoroquinolones and sequestration of fluoroquinolones. Does that make sense? Great. Uh, before we move on to this, what I expect you to know about resistance. Well, first of all, all that stuff about genes, you know, where resistance comes from, you know, that it's genetic, that it can exist there, out there in the environment. Second, regarding the mechanisms, you have to know, you have to I give you a description. The microbe, blah, 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 um, produces the enzyme that breaks down penicillin. This is the example of target modification, drug modification, target overproduction, or something else. Right? And you match, in this case, drug modification to the end, to the question. Does that make sense? Or it may go another way. The example of target modification would be, and I give you three, four descriptions, and you pick one. Is that clear? Okay. Now, with this, I always say, if you're not sure about whether you understand the question right, always ask me a question. If, if there is a need, we will make a, a, a picture. We will draw it, okay? 
so you can understand better what I'm asking. Because I want my question to be crystal clear. All right? Good. We can move on to drug resistant bacteria. Um, for this, you have to understand what they are. I mean, and I say what they are, uh, you have to understand all those acronyms, what they mean. So if I ask you what VRE stands for, you have to know that it's vancomycin resistant enterococci. Why I pay so much attention to seemingly just memorization issue? This is something that you will run into in the clinic. You really have to know about that. Okay. And you have to understand what they are resistant to. Names are self-explanatory, so it shouldn't be a big problem. Okay. So we're going to start with MRSA. Methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Methicillin is uh, a a semi-synthetic drug, pretty much a modified penicillin. You follow me? So MRSA rose when when was it? Something like early two thousands, I think. Um, first cases of the Staphylococcus infection that did not respond to the conventional treatment with penicillins, they started to appear. And it was mostly wound infections, uh, which were really hard to treat. I had a student in a class who had, before the class, she had a wound infection, MRSA wound infection, and she showed the pictures. Well, first of all, staph warriors wound infection isn't pleasantly looking anyway, and it took her about four months of antibiotic therapy to finally heal. Um, now, MRSA may not only cause wound infections in the hospitals, it's, it's also a community-acquired pathogen because it's present in the considerable percentage of population. Staphylococcus aureus is normally a part of microbiome in about one quarter of population, and we can only imagine how many of those people have methicillin-resistant staph aureus. Along the wound, among, uh, together with the wound infections, can also cause respiratory diseases like pneumonia, and the worst case scenario is septicemia, which means that the bacteria replicates in the blood. You may have heard now that MRSA is has become much less of a hype now. In the microbiological community, MRSA is now considered a new normal. Okay. Not that it's less dangerous, no. The idea is this is something we have to live with. Okay, it, it it's not it's not an emergency, it's not outstanding pathogen. It's a normal pathogen that doesn't respond to this, so we have to treat it with something else. Does that make sense? Resistance to vancomycin, vancomycin resistant enterococci and staph aureus. <clears throat> so those are nosocomial pathogens. So they induce, they, they cause hospital acquired infections. And enterococcus, enterococcus fecalis and enterococcus fecium are the normal components of uh, microbiome in the human digestive tract. And not surprisingly, when infections, say streptococcal or staphylococcal infections, were treated with vancomycin, those microbes in the digestive tract, they acquired resistance. What you have to understand, though, is that resistant, resistance to antibiotics by itself doesn't mean that microbe will cause disease. You understand that, right? It's not about disease, it's about resistance to treatment, right? So enterococci, when they are in the guts, they don't cause any disease. I often say that microbial diseases, in many cases, 
arise from putting microbes in the wrong place. Like Staphylococcus aureus in the wound. It's not supposed to be there. Or Enterococcus into the urinary tract or in the wound. Infections with Enterococcus fecium and Enterococcus fecalis, mostly infections of the urinary tract and wound infections that may progress to septicemia with all complications, such as endocarditis and stuff like that. Uh, but when these microbes, even resistant ones, are in the gut, they find and you are fine. Did I make the case here? The next one is extended spectrum beta lactamase positive gram negative microbes. That's kind of a tongue breaker. So let's talk about each part of that statement separately. Gram negatives. What do we include in this? Um, Pseudomonas, Enterobacterogenes, E. coli, Salmonella, Shigella, Proteus mirabilis. A bunch of microbes that can be primary pathogens or opportunistic pathogens of humans. What is common between them is that they are all gram negatives. Is that clear? What is common for those gram negatives? Um, antibiotics of last generation, the carbapenems, a broad range antibiotics that were very effective against various gram negative uh, microbes. And essentially, by now, those hospital acquired microbes started to develop resistance to carbapenems. Now, carbapenem. I want to remind you, so not the carbapenems, everything else. Carbapenems, they're still good. I'm mixing up with the next one. So, we have uh, drugs like cephalosporin or uh, strionam that can be used to treat gram negatives. All these drugs contain beta lactam ring. When microbe has extended spectrum beta lactamase, this means that this one enzyme can confer resistance to various classes of drugs. Does that make sense? It means extended spectrum. Not only resistance to penicillin, not only to methicillin, not only to ampicillin, not only to cephalosporin, but to all of them. Does it make sense? So it really limits our options. Okay? The last two, the true icing on the cake, really top of the list, the winners. First is CRE, carbapenem resistant Enterobacteriaceae. So what is Enterobacteriaceae? E. coli? Salmonella, Klebsiella, the inhabitants, normal or pathogenic inhabitants of the human digestive tract. And one of the latest examples for CRE was the strain of Klebsiella and strain of E. coli carrying the genes, making them resistant for car uh, to carbapenems, okay? So these guys also are causing hospital-acquired infections, but carbapenem-resistant Enterobacteriaceae, E. coli and, and Klebsiella, uh, came to United States from the country that gave us many, uh, many great things. It gives us, gave us chess, um, Tan, uh, Tandoori Kitchen, absolutely awful movies. I'm talking about India. Okay. I think we discussed partially the reasons why. Did we? About India, no antibiotic use? Oh, we did. So, <clears throat> what's so special about India? Except for really horrible 
movies. What's the population of the country? A little bit more than a billion. Okay. So the infectious diseases is the everyday reality for them. Okay, microbes have a field day in India. Second thing is the public health system. Although you see a lot of Indian doctors here and medical education in India is really top notch. To have to get the right to prescribe medicines, you don't have to be a doctor. They have kind of lower level health professionals. And those health professionals start prescribing drugs not in the way they're supposed to be prescribed. I don't know, two month treatment. But instead they say, oh, take it for a week, you're going to be fine. Does that make sense? That's, that's a real problem. I'm not making it up. It's a real problem. So there is very little compliance to the proper treatment regimens in India. I don't know why. Probably because India industrialized enough to implement a lot of antibiotics, but compliance is still lacking. Does that make sense? So it drives resistance like crazy. The, one of the strains of E. coli that contains the uh, carbapenemase is called New Delhi strain. It arose in Delhi. I mean, that's kind of revealing. Okay? You may ask, what about other countries that on par with India, like China, Russia? Well, first of all, Russia has 140 million people population. So um, we can't contribute that much. And most of it empty anyway. Uh, but you can buy antibiotics over the counter. You don't even need a prescription. Hmm? We used to smuggle them all the time. Like acyclovir. Ever heard? Ah, we didn't talk. It's an, an anti-herpes oh. drug. Here it is used orally and IV to treat like severe herpes. In Russia you can buy a cream. Works wonders again uh, for cold sores. Just wander, so we we bring it in all the time. Yeah. Ooh, my man, awful. The reasons are uh, reasons are over overcrowded. Not because we're so bad. No, no, we we're good people. Not because we have so many villains. Because we have too little prisons. I mean, they really size down. So. People like sleep in shifts. Um, and that crowdness, crowdedness, whatever the word is, drives the rate of infections. And treatments are far from perfect, so there's a lot of resistance there. Okay, But with 140 million, come on, a contribution is small. I did, yes. Um, in grad school. China, uh, I bet on communists. I lived, I lived in communist country. For like 12 years it was communist country. It was awesome. I played with my friends. I, I ate cookies, candies. It was perfect. Communism was, was the best time in my life. And then the whole thing fell apart and I went to high school. I don't know what was worse. Um, now, Oh yeah, yeah, everybody, everybody was suffering at the time. Um, but when I was a kid, we didn't hear about the option not to vaccinate kids. It was not on the menu. Nobody asked you. Yeah, you just, you come to the doctor and they tell you, okay, now you get the vaccine. You don't say, I don't want to. No. You go and vaccinate. So. Um, I can imagine enforcement towards doctors, like to prescribe properly. And probably compliance may be a part of the national culture. So I can imagine Chinese folks uh, being very diligent in terms of the medical use of antibiotics. But uh, speaking of agricultural use, I don't know. Now, they produce a ton of pork. I think they are the biggest pork producer in the world. China. So 
the top notch, the most fearsome tuberculosis. Okay. So MDR, XDR, TDR stands for multi-drug resistant, uh, extensive drug resistant, total drug resistant tuberculosis. And the last one is scary. Total drug resistant. MT stands for mycobacterium tuberculosis. Okay. It resist it is resistant to rifampin, fluoroquinolones, isoniazid, canamycin, tetracyclines ages ago. Everything. All options. Yep. Um so should we be scared? Uh yes. Uh, shitless, no. Humans are intrinsically resistant to tuberculosis. About 5% of infected people ever develop clinical disease. According to some estimations, one-third of the world population is actually infected. But not everybody gets sick. Okay? Um, disease affects a lot of them, people with... Uh, immune problems like HIV patients or people after the transplant or people on the chemotherapy. If you would uh, go to Africa and survey areas with high rate of uh, HIV prevalence and there are areas where you have 25 percent of the population HIV positive, you will see that develop the, the how to say, Developed HIV, pretty much AIDS and TB, walk hand by hand. Okay. Um, now, is that a problem in the U.S.? Not to the same extent as it is a problem in Africa or India. In Africa, because the, there are no drugs. In India, because there's so much resistance. In U.S., tuberculosis is not that um, abundant, but there was a famous case when uh, one dude was diagnosed with resistant, totally drug-resistant TB, and was strongly advised not to go anywhere, but he hopped on the plane and flew back to India for his friend's wedding, and then flew back to U.S., and they had to test the entire, two entire planes of people to see if they acquired. Nobody got it, but yeah, well, um, people do stupid things. Let's put it this way. It, I don't. Uh, I don't think so. I think it's for intentional, in, intentional exposure. There are some restrictions, uh, but I don't think he got any, at least, felony. Okay. Now you may ask, what do we do in case of total drug resistance? It's usually long therapy, so months and months, combination of drugs in high dosages. So that's, that sucks. Okay. Um, I believe at some point it's going to be new normal. And we will, we will have to develop new antibiotics. Extant the multiple drug resistance is already new normal. Total drug resistance, yes. Uh, the problem with antibiotic development, if you would look at the timeline roughly, you would see a lot of antibiotics being developed in 50s, 60s, 70s. And then, I don't remember the exact date, but the last big breakthrough was like in the 90s. And since then, we didn't get any new antibiotics. We got slightly modified, but there was not a major group discovered. Does that make sense? So we need to do that sooner or later. So how we test the efficiency of uh, antibiotics? One method you've already done yourself. This is called Kirby-Bauer test. So you make a lawn, lawn culture of the microbe on the agar plate, and you place this uh, little circles uh, that are infused with the drug on the agar and you observe the inhibition zone around the disc. 
Does that make sense? And then you can measure the zone. And for each, now, each disc has a certain drug in the certain concentration. Does that make sense? So you can measure the inhibition zone and say for, I don't know, penicillin at certain concentration against staph aureus. If the inhibition zone is more than 10 millimeters in diameter, uh, staph aureus is sensitive. If it's less than this, staph aureus is not sensitive. Does that make sense? The larger the zone, the inhibition zone, the more sensitive microbe is. So this is the method that is used in hospitals to do antibiograms. I, I don't remember if we talked about antibiograms. Uh, once in a while, I don't know the exact frequency, not of course every week, but for some time, from time to time, a team of clinical microbiologists walk through the hospital. If you work in the hospital, that's what happens there. They walk through the hospital and they take swabs from toilets, rails, plenty of places. And then they put them on the plates, they isolate microbes in a pure culture, and that's going to be the main, um, and they have certain protocols how to grow them, how to identify them. So eventually they have a set of most common microbes that are in the hospital, nosocomial microbes. Does that make sense? And then they test them using Kirby Bauer test. Because if you have a patient who definitely acquired something from the hospital toilet, you know what to treat the patient with. You know that if it's, I don't know, produced mirabilis, you know that it's going to be sensitive to that tetracycline, for instance. Okay, and you can use tetracycline. But you will avoid something else. Is that clear? What is the advantage of Kirby Bauer test? Easy to see, easy to quantify, fast, cheap. What is the disadvantage? Uh, wh what do you mean? Well, I see what you're saying. So, um, microbes, no, microbes that are resistant, you will see them. You will see the microbes that are resistant, but you will see resistance only to the certain concentration. Does that make sense? So say you have a microbe that's resistant to 10 micrograms. What if you take 20? What if you take 100? Can you? So Kirby Bauer test doesn't let you to determine sensitivity to different concentrations. Okay, but it allows you to test many uh, antibacterials at the same time. To check sensitivity to different concentrations, use dilution tests. You can do the old style. So you start with a high concentration of a drug and mix it with the bacterial culture. And then you dilute it, the drug. And you see that while the drug at the concentration of 8 micrograms per mil still inhibits bacterial growth, at 4, it does not. That make sense? So for this drug, minimal inhibitory concentration, and that's a strict term, minimal inhibitory concentration, MIC, will be between 8 and 4. It will be less... 8 or less, right, but more than 4. Does that make sense? And then you can make dilutions between that 8 and 4 and, you know, make it, make the smaller increments and find out the exact MIC. So you really want to know what is the minimal concentration of the drug at which it inhibits the bacterial growth. So this using using tubes is sort of an oil old style, new style. You can take this fancy 
96 well played, okay, and put the culture in the wells. So this is the positive control here, the growth control. So yellow dots represent bacteria. And then you mix bacteria with the drug and see whether you stop growth or not. So for instance, here, clindamycin shows that not even a highest concentration of a drug 32 microgram per mil inhibits the growth of whatever it is. Does that make sense? Um, here, no growth, growth. So for penicillin, you're going to have, just an, as an example, for penicillin, the minimal inhibitory concentration will be 0 0.06 micrograms. That makes sense? So you determine minimal inhibitory concentration the advantage of the plate is that you can test multiple drugs against one microbe at the same time and get quantitative result. Make sense? It's I, 96 wells are a little bit uh, labor intensive. Um, I worked with 96 well plates. I personally knew people who worked with 384 well plates. The plates are about this big. So they they slightly smaller than the phone, size-wise. There are 1,584 well plates. But as far as I know, they are used in automated machines. The wells are too small. But 384, yeah, people people do it by hand. And you have to remember which well you worked with, which one you didn't, which is which sucks. Now, another method that was developed is called e-tests or e-strip. You see it right here. So e-test is essentially a combination of Kirby Bauer and disk, uh, sorry, and dilution test. You have a strip of special paper that's infused with the... Um, antibiotic and its concentration goes from high to low. You place this strip on the lawn culture and observe the inhibition of bacterial growth. Make sense so far? And you can see that the zone of inhibition becomes narrower as the concentration of a drug decreases. Here, where the inhibition is gone, is the minimal inhibitory concentration. Does that make sense? Now, say you determined inhibitory, you determined the dose at which the drug will be effective. This dose is called effective dose, and it is actually the dose that is used in pharmacology is effective dose 50, ED50, which means drug successfully treats 50% of patients at this dose. You understand? Toxic dose 50 is drug causes toxicity in 50% of the patients at this dose. Does that make sense? What should be higher? Which dose should be higher, toxic or effective? Hmm? So you mean that if uh, to get buzzed, you need to drink two bottles of vodka, but you're going to puke after one shot, that's what it's supposed to be. It should be opposite, right? you got to have lower dose to have an effect than the dose to be toxic. Does that does that make sense? If okay, if the drug cures you at one microgram and poisons you at a hundred, is that a good drug? It cures you at one is that a good if it if it's an opposite, if it poisons you at one microgram, 
but it takes 100 micrograms to cure you, it's a bad drug. Does that make sense? <coughs> so the ratio between the toxic and effective dose is called therapeutic index. It kind of shows you spread. So say if toxic dose is 200 and effective dose is 5, what's the therapeutic index? Huh? No, no, no. No. Ratio, ratio. You have to divide toxic dose by effective dose. So it's 40. Does that make sense? Now, if you have one drug with a therapeutic index 40 and another with a therapeutic index 200, which one is better? Second. Huh? Second. Second one. Higher therapeutic index is better. <coughs> Why? Mm -hmm. Pretty much, first of all, if somebody ODs, there's less chance that the person will die. Do you understand why is that? Okay? It's like if, if uh, the effective dose is one spoonful, and if you consume two, you're going to die, it's not a great drug. Okay? If the effective dose is one spoonful, and to die you need to drink two liters, that's a pretty good drug. Okay? Make sense? So, the higher the therapeutic index, the better. Another thing to consider, you have some, with a high therapeutic index, you have some space to increase the dosage. Right? If the therapeutic effective dose doesn't work in the patient, you can crank it up. I always give an example of the drug with, there was a, a, a study, of some some drug that did cure was supposed to cure something in, in horses. So they took a horse, a model horse, and injected it with a drug in the morning. And drug was amazing. The horse was cured by 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 the evening. And the horse died in the morning. It was cured and then died because of the drug. So therapeutic index essentially is one. The effective dose is the same as toxic dose, right? So that's a bad drug. Does that make sense? The higher the therapeutic index, the better. Now, before we go to the break, I wanted to talk to you about something, and this something is drug development. Now we're going to play on the pharmaceutical company field, especially more of a drug testing rather than development. So. Let's start with the developing. Let's say you have a drug that showed its efficacy against certain infections in mice, dogs, uh, monkeys. It wasn't toxic to them. What do you do next? You have a drug that is promising. Huh? Which trial you start first with? Hmm? No, no, um, you've done mice, you've done mice, you've done dogs, you've done monkeys, animals are done, it works in animals, and it looks like it's safe in animals. So you, you're ready to move to humans. What do you do first? Which trial? Huh? No, 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 no. You're done with cells. You need humans. Oh, you're done with human cells. I mean, you, real humans, like... Like humans, flesh and bone. Volunteers. It's all volunteers. I mean, unless you can really force them, huh? Really? No, no, no. Think about this. What is the when FDA when you go to the uh, to the pharmacy and buy that over the counter uh, snake oil, like vitamins or chondroitin or some other crap that they sell? That doesn't really work. If you take this, are you going to die? Huh? No. So for these things, FDA, first of all, what does it approve 
anything like a drug or biological like food additive for safety first is safety so you get healthy volunteers and give them drug and see if they get poisoned that's the first thing they check for safety not efficacy no you need to make sure that it's not a poison in humans does that make sense not sick people because in sick people you don't know why they sick I mean are they sick because they were sick before or that's the drug or something like that does that make sense then you move on to test efficacy okay what is the ideal setup to test the efficacy of the drug double so okay what double blind means I'm a doctor, you're a patient. Yes, so the, the, the patient doesn't know and I don't know. Okay, we don't know whether, what, what we don't know. Yes, who's getting placebo, who's getting the drug. So it is called double blind, placebo controlled. Ideally, multi center which means we do it in Ohio, Kentucky, South Carolina, and California in different environments with different populations, all kinds of stuff. Can we do, and we now, now what, 2017, we discovered new antibiotic. Can we do this trial, double-blind placebo control, in the current environment? No, 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 there's only one answer. Why no? Why you can do double-blind placebo-controlled study of antibiotic? Nope, 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 you have a drug, hypothetical drug. Why you can't do double-blind placebo-controlled? You can do some other method, but not this. No, 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 no. You have, like, Mm, no. Okay, you have a thousand people that are sick. Half of them will receive a drug, and half of them will receive placebo. Yeah, it's ethically impossible. You cannot not treat people. Does that make sense? You cannot deliberately give people placebo. No, I mean, in, 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 in the scope of the study, you cannot deny the treatment if you have one. So say, if I want to treat pneumonia, if I want to test the drug against pneumonia, I cannot take people with pneumonia and tell them, look, you're in the lottery, you may be cured or you may die. Or you may die anyways if my drug is ineffective. Right. It's, it's a different story. So, first of all, technically speaking, now even with cancer, you cannot do that. If there is a treatment, you cannot deny the treatment. Does that make sense? If you have a patient who has a treatment option, the old treatment and if there is a chance it will work you can't do only the new one or no treatment at all you have to supplement does that make sense if all other treatment options are exhausted like cancer patients they gone through all procedures it didn't help then they may be in the trial for the new drug does that make sense if they ran out of options but with antibiotic it's different say we have people with pneumonia you have to give all of them conventional treatment say I don't know tetracycline okay and you will supplement the treatment with either placebo or your new drug and then you will compare which one is better if your new drug doesn't make a difference, it sucks, okay? If it makes a difference, 
then you may start comparing the old and the new, but you can't deliberately not treat people. It's really a painful process, actually. Okay? That's just, I wanted you to, to think about it. Okay.